Okay, so we're going to start our next session now with Peter Sullivan, who is the Senior Executive Benefit Specialist, and he is going to talk to us today about improving investment options during challenging economic times. Peter is a Senior Executive Benefit Special for Cuban Mutual Group, a company that specializes in design, implementation, financing, and ongoing administrative support of supplemental executive benefit programs specifically tailored to credit unions. Peter is located in the Eastern region and brings to CUNA Mutual Group his experience in the financial service industry since 1990. Peter most recently held a position of Vice President Multi-Life Sales at Lion Street where he has helped business owners with executive benefit plans designed in multi-life program for employees. Peter holds various FINRA security registrations, a graduate of the Southeastern Massachusetts University. Peter also received a Juris Doctor degree from the Massachusetts School Board. Peter is also a member of the Massachusetts Bar. Well, thank you today, Peter, for joining us. Oh, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Joe, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, would you like me to, to kind of jump right into it, Christine? You Before, certainly can. Yeah. Okay. And thank you for all the uh, all the credit unions that uh, tuned in today. And, and again, uh, nice to see all of you again. At least speak with you, at least uh, if not in person, at least uh, virtually. So, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day. So, in setting this up, uh, I thought actually uh, Jeff did a really nice job. And so I always like to follow Jeff because he does such a, I think, a very thorough job and a really uh, has a nice way of kind of level setting what the challenges are in the marketplace. And I think. This year, especially, has really become uh, uh, very unique in a sense from an interest rate perspective. So, with that said, uh, Jeff, this last slide actually, I thought really laid it out. What, what I'm going to talk about today is really about solutions, uh, and they really fall into the impermissible category. So, as Jeff covered a lot of ground and he covered, I think, a lot of different things and variables that, that go into your day to day operations, these are somewhat a little more focused. Uh, they're, I would think of these as tools that you have at your disposal to be able to utilize if you want to, uh, to help drive additional income back to the credit union. And it's uh, it's permitted, it's sanctioned by the NCUA and the state. And so the, the nice thing is, um, again, as we go through this, these are additional opportunities to really help address some of the things that Jeff had pointed out in the first hour. So with that said, Christine, if we can go to the next slide, uh, I think that'll set the stage for this. And I'm just, just uh, I think you're driving the presentation, correct? Yes, am I on the right one? Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Christine, that'd be terrific. Are you seeing the um, changes of it? I am not, I'm, I'm still on the cover slide. So if we can go to slide two, that'd be super. Oh, cause I'm on, You're let on. me see what I can do. We can, if not, we can try to share or something like that. So you have it. That's why don't we stay right there. That's, I think, a good place to start it. That's, that's a little bit ahead of the first slide, but that's okay. And um, so Jeff articulated really well interest rates. You know, a year ago at this time, it was interesting. We were looking at rates going up. Uh, overnights, as you know, were one and a half, two percent 2%. It was a different world. We saw everything that happened in January, February, and March of this year. And right now, we're challenged with really, it's being obviously an all time low. It's not something I'm. Tell you that question is what is uh, what's happening in the second bullet here, which I think is really interesting, is high level deposits. If you're similar to most of the creditors that I work with, and I work with uh, quite a few in Vermont as well, um, they're seeing uh, deposits at a level that they just haven't seen. And the question becomes, what do you do with that money, and where, how do you reposition it? And I thought it was interesting on Jeff's last presentation. His first bullet was try to reposition, try to try to get dollars off the balance sheet. And uh, it's not uncommon to get a call from a CEO or a CFO and say, I've got. 50 60 million dollars what can i do with it and as we'll talk about there's some there's some limits and things like that but there are some opportunities to reposition some of those dollars into investments that you would not otherwise be able to purchase and really drive a better yield and so the third bullet jeff articulated very well and then obviously right now again compared to a year ago the permissible returns that, that we're seeing again the overnights being at five or ten basis points and even on the permissible side when i talk to other credit unions what I'm seeing is return of somewhere between 50, 60 basis points, maybe, uh, and just not a lot of places to go. So uh, if you're if you're doing a little better than that, that's that's a testament to your 
the skill set. That's what I'm seeing. Uh, and then the fourth bullet, the fifth bullet, really is that liquidity. And again, that's the question. What do you do with the dollars that you have on? Jeff gave some good examples of doing that. Uh, these are a couple other ways of uh, redeploying those assets. So, Christine, if we can go to the next slide. So, as you look at interest income and you look at options for better returns, remember the investments we're going to talk about here. These would not be permissible. These would be what's called impermissible investments. And for that, you need to have reasons to have those. Um, and the NCUA will let you do that. Just think of it like a gateway. Think of it as uh, there are doors to walk through, if you will, to, to purchase investments like this. And there's really only three different ways, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. First is through executive benefit plans, which you may or may not already have. That you can buy an impermissible, which you would not otherwise be able to purchase for that purpose. You can also do it to offset your employee benefit expenses, such as health insurance, pension costs, especially right now, the low interest rate environment we're seeing uh, in the stock market being at a relatively flat level this year, especially on the defined pension side of things. We're seeing uh, some shortfalls there where um, credits are looking at these type of programs as, as ways to help fill that gap just from an income perspective because of the expenses being um, created by the defined, bench, uh, benefit, uh, defined benefit pension plan. And then obviously the investments, uh, depending upon what you're investing in, it's certainly conceivable to get a better return than on the permissible side, but there's also trade-offs when it comes to accounting and it comes to the overall risk return uh, expectation that you may have. And then finally, uh, 2018, uh, FASB changed some of the accounting rules, which do have an impact in terms of how you recognize these investments and what they do when it comes to uh, uh, performing a your income statement, whether or not they affect it. Uh, on a monthly basis, or in fact, they, they may not, depending on how you structure them. So those are the things that we're going to cover. Christine, if we can go to the next slide. So as you mentioned on this, uh, your employee benefit expenses don't, don't generally go down, and health costs tends to be the most um, the largest piece of that. And again, so the NCAA has recognized that, the state has recognized that, and, and they're, again, allowing you to uh, purchase investments to help offset the cost. It's very, very difficult to be able to offset your, all your expenses because of some of the limitations on these programs, but uh, you do have the ability to, to maybe mitigate some of the costs each year. And then obviously compensation benefits, just keeping your quality people, that's certainly as incomes uh, rise, as competition for talent increases, uh, that increases the uh, expense there as well. So again, this is another tool that helps you offset that. And again, uh, these have been around for a while. They're not new. Uh, this concept has really been around since 2003. There are, we just, just uh, CUNY Mutual, who I represent, we have over $3 billion in these type of investments. And that's just us. Uh, in the marketplace, it's, it's multi-billions of dollars are invested in these type of programs. Uh, and it's also, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, you can see what credit, uh, the percentage of credit unions that are taking advantage of these type of programs and at what level. So Christine, if we go to the next slide. And the more recent addition to the idea of using impermissible investments is what's called a charitable do donation account. And we know as an as a, as a industry, we're extremely uh, uh, charitable. We tend to give back to the community much more so than uh, some other uh, industries. And so the NCUA recognized that in addition to just helping to offset employee benefit expenses, they'll also let you reach out for donation funds. And the advantage of this, as we'll talk about in a minute, is if you're giving away money today already and you've earmarked money for charities and you want to continue that giving, because of the low rate of return that we're now seeing on the permissible side of things, um, you've, got to, you've got to put away a little bit more money or, or, or park more money, if you will, to get just the amount of return just to offset those uh, donations at the current level. When you're able to get a better rate of return on those investments, you're effectively able to put away less money or give away more uh, income or more uh, money to, to your local uh, charities. So again, it gives you another tool to be able to use. And uh, this came out in 2013, relatively new, but actually is probably the, the fastest grower when I think of, of what credits are doing today. Uh, initially to get into these type of programs. It, uh, a charitable donation account tends to be uh, the first gateway if they have never done it before because it, it goes to the mission of who we are as an industry and it makes an awful lot of sense. So if we go to the next slide, Christine, we can see this is a, a really nice example. Uh, this is a really nice example uh, of the average 
uh, percent of creditors that are actually using these type of investments and at what level. So uh, within the 100 to $500 million range, 58% of creditors typically are using these type of investments in some way, shape or form. And the average percent of capital that they're actually using is close to 20%. So you can get a sense of where you fit into this, this uh, graph, if you will, or where you, what category you fit into. But I think what you'll find here is these are not uh, something new. They're not, uh, they're not relatively uh, um, difficult to, to put in or administer, but really much more prevalent within the industry. And as such, when the examiners look at these, for the most part, they tend to understand what they are or um, they've seen it before they have an understanding. And that's where um, we can help you with or obviously CFO and, and the folks that are, are working with these programs. Uh, it's not something they should think about as being something new or something different or something that they're not uh, uh, out of line, out of step with the industry. And if we go to the next slide, Christine. So what this is really letting you do is again, and it's, it's, you're able to, to break away from the permissible side of the uh, statement, income statement, if you will, and actually invest in something uh, that would otherwise be impermissible, but there are limitations to it. And uh, as, uh, as we're finding today where credits are so flush with liquidity, this becomes again, a really nice way of trying to reposition some of those dollars into a different asset class that's gonna hopefully uh, return some income, which may offset some of the declines in income that you're seeing in other areas. Next slide, Christian. Let's take a look at how the pre-funding works. Again, it has to be used to offset employee benefit expenses. And so the simplest way of looking at that is you have employee benefit expenses, which include everything really under ERISA, health, uh, health pensions, um, could even be long-term care, things like that, anything that you offer to your employees. And that expense, I would, I would argue, is probably a pretty significant number relative to uh, the amount of money that you could actually invest in this type of investment. So, but that's the first gateway. So when the NCUA, the state comes in, they're gonna ask you, well, you have this investment, what are you what are you using it for? And the short answer is, we're using it to offset employee benefit expenses. You don't have to pay any employee benefit expenses out of this particular fund. You simply have to have a reason and you have to track the employee benefit expenses uh, in order to make sure that if I have X amount of income, X amount of expenses, that the income doesn't exceed the expenses. And for most credits, it's very, very difficult to do uh, to not not to do that, but to to generate more income than you would have in expenses, and the reason for that is the third bullet down here. Uh, the NCUA came out with a rule a couple of years ago, and what they said very simply is, as a as a guideline, not a rule, but we expect we would prefer that credit even stay within twenty five percent of overall capital in any uh, any of these impermissible investments, and that does include monies that would be in uh, executive benefits. It would include money that's obviously in these what we would call total back for pre funding plans. Now, that isn't to say the creditors don't go above that. I have creditors that do that, and I have creditors that are well below it. Um, what, what it does mean, though, is from an NCUA perspective, and the state's a little different, uh, they're going to have their own set of rules, but effectively, uh, they're going to look at maybe giving you a little more scrutiny, if you will, um, if you're above 25%. I think uh, in talking with our folks, if you will, who uh, have, uh, have worked with the NCUA on, the, on these rules, there's probably a little more leniency right now in that, given the low trade environment, they recognize that there's a real struggle to generate income. And they know that uh, uh, your hands are tied in some, some areas. So uh, we're not seeing as much of a pushback on the 25%. But what we do see some pushback is uh, what's called a concentration risk, which means that they don't wanna see any more than 15% of capital going to any one particular investment, i.e. insurance company, things like that. And so that's an area that we, we do see uh, a little bit of pushback. We certainly would suggest that if you're thinking about that, just make sure that whatever investment you go into is fairly well diversified or you're not exceeding 15% of capital in any one particular insurance company or investment. But overall, uh, we suggest credits stay within 25% if they can. If there's a reason for them to go above that, just document it and make sure that uh, the examiner that you're working with has an understanding of why you're doing that. And, um, and, and typically just be, be ready to defend it is, is what it comes down to. On the next slide, Christine. We can talk with the CDA. Now, as I mentioned, the, the, the charitable nations are actually uh, an area that we've, we've seen a lot more activity in, although uh, this year has been interesting because of the interest rate environment we're at, that actually the, the pre-funding plans, although from a legacy standpoint, we've seen more of those. We're starting to see uh, quite a bit more activity as well in the pre-funding side of things, simply because of the interest rate. 
environment with today. But charitable nation accounts came out in 2013. Uh, took about a year or two to really start to generate some some uh, speed, you might say. And then between 17, 18, 19, uh, we saw a huge increase in this. And it, it, it's simply because it goes to who we are as, a, uh, as, a, as an industry. Um, if you're already giving money away today, it simply allows you to either, as I said before, either give away more money or commit less capital to the same amount of giving. And, uh, but there are some limitations to that. Uh, and effectively what you have is uh, you can't do any more than 5% of overall capital cannot, can go, cannot go to uh, uh, a charitable initial account. So it's a hard and fast rule. Unlike the, the guideline of 25% for the total benefit pre-funding plan, the 5% is a hard and fast rule. You can't go above that. But the nice thing is that 5% is outside of the 25% that we talked about earlier. So theoretically, if you add the two, you could, you could get up to almost 30% of capital invested in impermissible investments. The second part is that uh, you have to give away at least 51% of overall income to the credit, to the uh, to 501c3 charities. And if we take a look at the next slide, it'll I give a nice summary of exactly uh, why, 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 why these credits are doing this. One is we know that uh, consumers like to purchase from uh, organizations that give back. It helps your standing in the community. It's very, very important in that sense. And then uh, the other part is this is really driven again, oftentimes by the board of directors who like the idea of giving back and being more of a part of the community. So the surveys tell us that uh, the, your consumers like it, it helps you in the community and it makes an awful lot of financial sense. If we go to the next slide, Christine. So as I mentioned, just to reiterate, 5% is, is the total limitation. You can't do any more than 5%. Uh, minimum of 51% of the earnings must be do donated to a 501c3 charity at the end of five years. And the nice thing there is it's not done annually. It could be if you want to, but there's some credits that will set up these programs and they'll let that run for four or five years. And then they'll, if you will, um, uh, get reimbursed for the donations they make. The other 49% of the earnings can go right back to the credit. And so again, it becomes a way for you to um, get a little more income on the books while still accomplishing your giving goals. Uh, and again, the final bullet here is this is a hard and fast rule. It cannot be more than 5%. So we typically recommend when creditors do this, um, limit it to, you know, maybe four, four and a half percent. Give yourself some cushion, if you will, uh, to make sure that you don't exceed the 5%. Then if we take a look at the next slide, which really gets into how do you, if you've, if you've made the decision, this makes some sense, then the, the bigger question becomes, well, what do I invest in? What, is, what does the landscape look like? And, and what kind of risk am I taking? Um, and it really comes down to really four different categories. The first being annuities, the second being what I would call managed money uh, investments. The third would be business owned or corporate owned life insurance. That's something that uh, has a lot of acronyms to it. In the banking world, they call it bully. In the credit world, we call it business owned. We call it corporate owned or credit union owned. Uh, the same concept, it's investment more so than a real insurance policy or a combination of all three. And so depending upon what your risk, it, what your risk return level expectation is and how much uh, income statement volatility, some, none, or, or a lot. Um, it, it really, that's what's going to drive the decision-making process. So each one of these investments brings different attributes to the table. It's just a matter of what, uh, uh, what is important to you from a credit perspective. And also, uh, as I mentioned before, because of the FASB accounting changes, some of these investments can live on the income statement, which means that they will flow through to your income statement, which may be something that you want to avoid, which may drive you in a different direction from an investment standpoint or maybe something that you may uh, embrace depending upon uh, the return you're looking to, to achieve. So if we take a look at the, the next slide, we can get a little, a little more granular on this. Now the annuities are interesting. Uh, we see annuities more on F plans and executive benefit plans. I see a little bit in the pre-funding uh, world and where I'm starting to see it a little bit is where we have uh, uh, annuities that have a floor and a cap, meaning that there's a, there's a targeted rate of return but there's also a, a floor which prevents uh, being uh, prevents a loss, and so there is some there is some attractiveness to that, uh, and we're seeing that a little bit. But it does have the uh, it, it does still throw, flow through your income statement, so therefore uh, you're going to see some volatility with that. But you can manage that risk through again um, the uh, the guarantees within the annuity itself and the fixed annuities. We don't see all that often, candidly, just because of the rates where they're at today. Variable gives you a little more of an upside, again, depending on the guarantees of the contract. And then the index, or what I would call a, uh, a structured note type of annuity, will give you a floor and a cap that, again, we're finding more and more credits 
liking that uh, ability to be able to protect the downside, but have some upside potential as well. So that's usually the first area of just looking at uh, what annuity may do and doesn't make any sense for you. If we look at the next category, which is business owned life insurance, uh, this is an area that actually we're, we're seeing an awful lot more traction this year with. And the simple reason is that the rates haven't changed. And the good news there is the rates were basically the same last year. So what we're seeing in the marketplace is the, the, the corporate owned life insurance or business owned life insurance, the, the, the uh, credit rates is roughly uh, 2.8%. And it's a net rate, so there's no expenses, there's nothing that really comes off of that. And that hasn't really changed. It's come down a little bit since last year, but not much. Whereas the interest rate environment that we're all facing has, has changed dramatically. So a year and a half ago or a year ago when overnights were at one and a half percent and they were at 2%, uh, Coley wasn't all that attractive. Um, so you wouldn't see a lot of people going into it. But today you're seeing more activity in this particular investment because of the fact that uh, the, corp the Coley rate is 2.8, overnights are at five or 10 basis points. Maybe your permissibles are at 50, 60 basis points. So two and a half percent relative to those is a pretty good rate of return. And the nice thing about it is it doesn't give you any principal risk. A uh, dollar goes in, dollar earns interest. Uh, and essentially they're, they're fairly liquid. We suggest when you think about going into this type of investment though, that you think about it for the long term. And the reason for that is there are very few carriers within this space that are willing to offer these products to the credit union marketplace. And the reason for that is um, as a nonprofit uh, environment, there's no disincentive for you to liquidate the insurance at a later time if you want to. And so the insurance companies recognize that. And so if you were to flip over the banking world, there'd be four or five, six carriers who would all be competing for the business in the credit space. There's really no one or two. And the, the rationale again is because of the tax nature of, of credit unions. Uh, so when, when you go into these accounts, I would view these again as long-term investments. You can essentially get out of them if you had to. But the flip side of that is you probably wouldn't be able to purchase Coley again because there's so few carriers and they just would probably uh, just simply wouldn't sell it to you. Um, the way I would view Coley from an investment perspective is think of it as a, a portfolio of either uh, car loans or even uh, mortgages per se. And that essentially never has to be re-originated. Uh, so a good example is if you invested a million dollars in a Coley policy, that Coley policy once a year is simply going to get reset from an interest rate perspective. Um, but it won't, uh, uh, you'll never have to re amortize or re, re originate if you know what I mean. Whereas if you were to have a million dollar portfolio of car loans or, or even mortgages, those eventually will, will get paid off, will, will have to be re originated. So that's one way of looking at it. The second way of looking at it is it's a long term investment. It's, uh, it's something that's going to typically, uh, the underlying carriers are typically going out eight to 10 years. So they're getting a little better rate of return. Then obviously you're getting on a one year note, but you're basically getting that rate. Uh, or net rate on that, that's a little more attractive than a one year note, but essentially an eight or 10 year maturity. So uh, it gives you a little bit better rate of return than you typically see. It's very comparable right now to what I would say on the investment uh, grade bond side of things, actually probably a little bit better given where investment grade bonds are today. So that's another reason why it's become somewhat attractive and it's not tied to the stock market. So there's no volatility with that. Uh, just like we started January and February, there wasn't any folks who were in this, uh, this particular asset class didn't, didn't see any particular uh, uh, issues or heartburns uh, associated with uh, market declines. So it, it, it's a very simple, very uh, stable type of return. And as such, this year we're seeing more activity in this type of category than, uh, than we've seen actually in previous years. If we look at the next category, which is a little more dynamic, you can get into the uh, managed accounts. And this is this is also an area that uh, we do an awful lot of work and we see an awful lot of credit unions. Some of you may have investments like this. Um, a good example is you can you can buy individual stocks, individual bonds, uh, alternative investments. You get very well diversified. You can tailor the investment to anything that you want. And depending upon the underlying asset class of the investment, it may or may not flow through your income statement. Now, the benefit of having a managed investment portfolio is that the rate of return theoretically can be higher, uh, but you can also get some volatility. An example of this is would be in 2018, where uh, or 19, I should say, where these type of uh, portfolios did very, very well. There was simply no headwinds. The interest rates came down, the stock market did well. So hence these, these portfolios returned very well, which, which was a nice uptick for the uh, uh, investment income for the credit union. Flip side is this year, they're relatively flat in what we've seen, but you had to run through, you had to go through, 
February, March, where there was there were some steep declines and it was a very uh, fun period to be in. Uh, the flip side is it has over the long term uh, bounced back and has, uh, if you will, kind of made up for the losses that you had earlier on. But there is some volatility in this, in this category. Now, within the underlying portfolio itself, individual bonds can be treated what's called available for sale. And so what that means is you can hold individual bonds and you can hold them, they're called held to maturity, so they don't flow through your income statement. If you were to hold stocks or uh, anything that's in an ETF or a mutual fund, they would be treated as mark to market. So what happens there is you're gonna get some, uh, you could get some volatility, again, in those type, in those asset classes within the bond portfolio. Uh, if it's structured properly, you, you typically wouldn't see anything there. Um, and you would hope that one asset class would help offset the other. So these are fairly dynamic from a historical perspective, um, back from 08, 09, when we had the, I guess we would call the first recession. Uh, we saw a lot of people moving towards Coley uh, because of the stock market volatility. And what's, what's interesting, and then you saw a migration back to managed accounts between say 11, 12 up until, really it's still going on today, but we're also seeing people move back to Coley, as I said earlier, because of the, uh, the principal uh, risk, if you will, not being there in the fact that they don't, uh, doesn't give you any volatility. Now the flip side is you can also, uh, you can add these, you can add different pieces of these portfolios together. So if you had desire to do some sort of annuities or uh, some Coley and some managed accounts, they can all be managed, uh, if you will, under one umbrella, if that was something that uh, the credit was looking to, to accomplish. Now if we go to the next slide, for soon. So again, how you look at this is really, you wanna look at what your overall risk tolerance is. What, what is the overall uh, expectation? So if, if you're comfortable in that two and a half percent range, uh, corporate life insurance can make a lot of sense for you. If your investment objective is to get four, three and a half, four, four, five percent, you really need to be somewhere in the equity space to, to some extent to be able to get that. And, and the trade-off there again is uh, potentially some, some volatility that's gonna carry with it. Uh, but we do see credit unions do, do any one asset class, and we also see credit unions doing a combination of, uh, of all three. It's simply a matter of what is more important to you, and uh, again, what, what type of uh, volatility do you want to see in the income statement? Again, some, none, or, or a lot. It all depends. And the nice thing is these are all fairly what I would call open architecture, which means you can mix and match uh, as you see fit. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we often see credits will look at this and say, well, what, what, am I, what am I looking to achieve from an income perspective? And what am I willing to, to live with from a risk perspective? And again, it goes back to the idea of, of balancing these different investment classes out, um, being a, at least a nice starting place if that's something that you want to look at. Um, and again, these, these investments are, uh, these are additional tools that you have, in addition to everything that uh, Jeff said earlier, these are additional tools that you have if you have liquidity and you have the, the capacity to be able to do things like this. Uh, these are programs uh, that allow you to essentially drive additional income that you would not otherwise be able to, to do, but for, again, setting up a pre-funding plan or a charitable donation account. And so, again, when you look at those, uh, to, does that make some sense to you to have the collateral? Then it really gets a little more granular in terms of what do you want to do from an investment perspective? Um, and does that, um, does that align with your goals from an overall risk perspective? And Christine, if we go to the next page. And uh, in summary, that, that really does, uh, I know I kept it probably pretty simple, but unlike Jeff, where I think he had a lot of ground to cover, uh, my, my uh, focus is a little more uh, narrow, if you will. Uh, it does come down to a couple of different avenues in which you can utilize these type of investments. Obviously, this was meant as more of a, a higher level overview uh, of looking at this in terms of just more of an introductory conversation. But um, it is something that we're seeing a lot of credit, especially right now, taking advantage of uh, these type of investments because of the, the low income environment and the fact that right now, again, liquidity is so high that they're looking for places to, to frankly, to put the money. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting world, but a little different than we were a year ago. Any, any questions at all, or maybe yeah. I'm a little too quick? No, uh, thank you, Peter. Schedule, so. Thank yeah. you, Peter, for that. And we did have a couple of questions. Uh, one, the first one is, are you seeing more activity in the total benefits pre-funding? 
plans or the charitable donation accounts? So what's interesting, Christine, is a year ago, uh, the charitable donation accounts were, were very much, I was seeing a lot more activity there. And frankly, the folks on the pre-funding side of things, uh, there wasn't as much activity there simply because rates were higher in there. I think there were more alternatives on the permissible side of things and also loan demand. With liquidity and everything going on right now, there's still a significant amount of uh, demand, if you will, for the CDA because it seems to fit uh, well with our overall industry. And uh, so you see a lot of credit starting off in that category. And then what I'm seeing now is expanding it to the what I would call the pre-funding, meaning the more general employee benefit expense offsetting uh, programs because of the simple need that they have liquidity. The, the rates are, are what they are. They need somewhere to park this money and they're looking for alternatives that don't present a lot of risk, but give them a better return than what they're currently getting today. And uh, so we're, 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 it's probably 50-50 right now, but the interesting thing is the CDA probably hasn't really, the demand for that hasn't stopped or hasn't slowed down. It's just that all of a sudden we're seeing a lot more demand for the pre-funding type of dollars than we did say a year ago. And then another one is which investment strategies are you seeing credit unions utilize for these programs? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's, it's interesting. A year ago, and, and historically, corporate life insurance was not a big uh, component of these programs, especially here in the Northeast. Um, you can go to other parts of the country, and, and it, it has been. Uh, but in the Northeast, it really hasn't, which is interesting. In the last six months or so, we've seen a lot more corporate life insurance. Uh, uh, and the simple reason is because the rate relative to overnights and uh, on the permissible side is, is, is quite a bit different than it was a year ago. Before when overnights were at one and a half and you could generate two, two and a half on a permissible side uh, with those type of investments, um, the attractiveness of a 2.5 or 2.8 rate on a COLE wasn't all that compelling. Um, today it is. And the other flip side is we're not seeing, you don't see any volatility in that asset class. So we're seeing a lot more activity there, um, but we're also seeing activity in conjunction with managed accounts. So we're seeing the COLE being used more as a, uh, a fairly consistent rate of return um, and then maybe uh, bringing in some equities or things like that to try to get a little bit of an upside market uh, return as well. So a combination is, is what I'm seeing for the most part, but a lot more coal today than it was uh, a year ago or even six months ago for that matter. And I think it's a direct result of rates where they are in the market and the fact that uh, the interest rate on the coal uh, products simply haven't, haven't gone down that much. They've gone down a little bit, but not a lot. That's good. Well, thank you, Peter. And if anybody would like further information, they can email Peter at peter.sullivan at cunamutual.com.